So hello all and uh, welcome to lecture six of the series. I'll actually wait for a few seconds just so uh, the, uh, we give people time to catch up, you know, log in. But as an introduction, what we have done so far is to cover the basic idea of how we would train a neural network, namely that we, uh, you know, we cast it in a specific form as, a, as optimizing a function, a loss function. Uh, we, uh, uh, we spoke about uh, the gradient descent formalism and how we can compute gradients and so on, and how we can compute the derivatives required to compute gradients. So today we're going to be focusing on you know, sure, we built built up all of this framework, but does it, you know, why do we, why and when can we believe it will work? So uh, this is a quick recap. We found that neural networks are universal approximators. They can model any odd thing, provided they have the right architecture, but we must train them to approximate the function, which means that we must specify the architecture, which should be appropriate, and then learn the weights and biases of the network. And the way we train the net is to minimize the total loss on a training set, and we do so through empirical risk minimization. And the technique we use to minimize this loss is gradient descent. Now, the gradient of the loss with respect to network parameters is computed using back propagation. So this is what we've seen so far. And quick recap, here's the gradient descent algorithm again. Uh, if uh, this is how the gradient descent algorithm works. We want to find uh, this, the value x. From, if, we, if we are trying to minimize any function x with respect to its argument x, it means we're trying to find the value x where which the function, at which the function achieves its lowest value. So we begin with an initial guess x0, and then iteratively adjust this estimate by stepping against the derivative against the gradient, the gradient of the function until the function bottoms up. For neural networks, the function we want to minimize is this loss, uh, which is the average divergence between the, uh, the actual output of the network and the desired output of the network. And this loss, I've explicitly denoted it here, it's a function of the network parameters. So again, the way we do it, we initialize all of the network parameters and then uh, uh, we iteratively perform this operation where we go through the layers, compute the derivatives of the loss with respect uh, to the network parameters for the layer and then update the network parameters. So the key problem here is to implement gradient descent, we needed, we needed to be able to compute this derivative of the divergence for individual training instances and we do this using back propagation. And so we figure out how to implement gradient descent, but we were left with these questions. Will this procedure actually learn what we wanted to learn? And whether the network we learn in this manner will generalize. So let's begin by answering the first of these questions. So we move on. Yes. Questions, anything so far? Uh, there's some background. No what kind of noises are you track. hearing, guys? What there's kind of noises, noises are you hearing, I guys? I can't help it. This is, I've got my window closed. You're going to hear dogs barking. You're going to hear my fan behind me. If you don't want to see me sweating. And you're going to hear traffic. So. All right. So uh, here, here are the questions we're going to try to answer. Does backdrop always work? If so, how and when will it converge to the correct answer? What are the restrictions on it? And we, can we speed up the algorithm? Are, are there alternatives to gradient descent? And we will also look at uh, important modifications of the approach, the method of stochastic gradient descent and other speed up techniques. This last bit, we will not get to in this class. So we're going to be able to get as far as alternate approaches. Now, the first question we're asking, we're going to ask is this, will back propagation find the correct solution? So say we want the network to learn a classification function. We provide training data 
and minimize the average divergence between the sigmoid output of the network and the desired output using gradient descent. And say we found the parameters that actually minimize this loss. Does this mean that we have found the correct solution which gives us minimum classification error on the training data? So does anybody want to take a guess? If you set up your loss as we just did, and then gradient descent actually finds the value of the parameters that minimizes the losses. Is that assuredly the minimum classification error solution? Anyone? I'm speaking of a global minimum. If it finds the global minimum. Not necessarily. Not necessarily, why so? Someone says on the chat because it could be a local minimum and not a global. Yeah, but I'm saying it finds the actual minimum, right? So uh, again, even if you minimize the empirical risk, the true risk, is it going to minimize classification error? The answer is no. And so, uh, Let's see why, right? Recall what we said about differentiable activations. When we used a threshold activation and, and we computed the difference, what were we computing? When I was using threshold activations, what, what, was, I, what was I computing as my, uh, as, the, uh, as the objective that I was trying to minimize? What were we, what were we computing? Someone answered. The actual error, right? We were counting error. And we saw that in the case of threshold activations, if you're just counting error, just sliding this threshold back and forth does not tell you whether you're getting in the direct, moving in the direction where you want to, the error will decrease or in the direction where the error is going to increase. So, so again, this has nothing to do with the complexity of the model. It is something far more basic. So we wanted uh, for, for gradient descent to work, we, we, we replace this threshold activation with something continuous, right? And now, what was the term we were trying to minimize? Anyone? The divergence. What was the divergence? Yeah. It was the total length of these lines, right? Correct? And we saw that when we moved this left, the total length of the lines actually decreased and so if we try to minimize this this guy would slide back and eventually maybe end up something somewhere here and with that as your uh, threshold for classification it would give you the correct uh, correct uh, uh, answer the correct function but can you think of a condition where this will not work anyone anyone Someone has a microphone on. Okay, so give me this. Suppose I've got 1 million red dots over here. A very large number of red dots. Or a billion or a trillion. Okay. Now, does this distance ever really become zero when, you are, when you're using a sigma? No. Does it? No. 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 Okay. No. So suppose I have like, an, a, you know, an infinite points on this side and a finite number of points on this side. Which way will the line move? Right. It's going to move to minimize the error for the points that are masked at the cost of these guys, right? And so you can always construct, you know, if I have, so this guy is going to try to push this boundary out like so, just so that this huge mass can have very little distance. And you're going to get classification error. Does that make sense? Yes, no? Raise your hands if that makes sense. Uh, I have a question. So now, yeah. Yeah, um, so you said that um, the sigmoid would have to move to the uh, left to uh, match the red points at the cost of the blue points. Couldn't the sigmoid instead squish itself um, so that the linear part is smaller? If the only thing I might, 
So if, if, I'm not, if the only thing I'm allowing is moving left and right over here, for instance, got right? It. Got it, yeah. So, so I gave you a smooth function. I'm telling you that I'm, I, gave you a, I gave you a divergence, which is differentiable with respect to the shift. And I'm showing you that this can give you the wrong answer. Right? So what, what this means is that minimizing the divergence does not mean you found the minimum classification error solution. And in fact, there's a uh, very nice uh, paper by, by, by uh, Brady and, I forget what's the name. So this is uh, Brady, Raghavan and Slani in 1989, uh, who literally say, does back propagation always, you know, give you the correct answer? And they show that in classification problems, the classification error is a non-differentiable function of weights. The divergence minimizes only a proxy for the classification error, and minimizing the divergence may not minimize classification error. So uh, there are many slides over here. You will see that the slide number just jumped 21. The first 20 slides are actually explaining the little example that uh, that uh, uh, Brady et al. presented in their paper, but so is this. There are some arms, hands raised. Any questions? So, uh, Professor, uh, when you took the earlier example when there were one trillion points of one particular class, so wouldn't that be a problem with like any algorithm because of the class imbalance? Wouldn't we try to... Isn't that like a standard? No. Class? Okay. So let's go. There. Okay. No. Okay. Simple, right? I have uh, the simple example. I have a very large number of red points over here, a very large number of blue points over here. Will the perceptron algorithm, so compared to algorithms, the perceptron algorithm, which just uses a threshold activation and backprop, which uses a sigmoid, right? Will the perceptron algorithm find the correct solution here? Uh, yes. Anyone? Because the classes are linearly separable. What about backdrop? Right? It's going to find the correct solution too, because it's nice and clean, right? They're all neatly clumped. So it's going to find the right solution. Now, I add one spoiler over here. This is just one point, okay? Will the perceptron algorithm find the correct solution, find a solution that separates the two classes? Yes. Because it is guaranteed to do so and the classes are linearly separable, right? What about backdrop? So here's what happens with backdrop. With backdrop, if you look at the, you're looking at the average divergence, correct? If I have one trillion instances here and one trillion instances here and one solitary little fool are sitting out here, is this going to change the average divergence a whole lot? No. Because I can keep overloading these, right? It's maybe going to perturb it a little bit. And so, so Diksha says, yes. So you think it's going to change the divergence a lot having this one point? If I have like, if I'm taking the average of one trillion points and then one trillion and one points, will the two divergences be different? Unless the new point you're adding is giving you an infinity. They won't be, right? As a result, backdrop is simply going to move the solution from there to here. Now, Suppose I move the spoiler to this point out here. The perceptron algorithm is going to give you this. It's going to find the solution. Backdrop, not so much, right? Or if I move the spoiler over here, then the perceptron algorithm is going to find this dotted line. Backdrop, again, that's not going to move things very much. And so as I keep moving this spoiler around, what happens is that Every time I move the spoiler, the perceptron rule algorithm, which directly tries to maximize classification accuracy, and this was an, this this should answer the question earlier about isn't this you know training data imbalance etc. So 
does training data imbalance affect the perceptron role? No, it doesn't. And Manish, how do you decide that it's an outlier? Uh, because right, you don't. Um, because most of the points are like clumped together, and it is uh, this point is like separate from other clumps. So, so you are you are defining it as an outlier. So you so so but but the point is this. My point really is you are trying to minimize the loss, right? Additional semantics you put on top of it are assumptions you are making. Correct. So. Uh, this is the perceptron will always find the solution. Even if the data are imbalanced, it doesn't really matter, right? The person, but the person the point is that the perceptron may change greatly upon adding just a single training, new training instance. It will fit the training data well, and it will give you an exact solution for the training data. So long as the classes are separable. In other words, the perceptron rule has low bias. It is not going to give you a wrong answer. When you, when you say something has a low bias, it's not going to give you a wrong answer for your data. But it has high variance, meaning if I, I can move out of one trillion training points, I can move one single training point, and the answer is going to swing wildly, right? On the other hand, backdrop, when I just move a small number of points, it's going to be minimally changed. It, uh, uh, prefers consistency over perfection. So, but this comes at the cost of accuracy. So backprop is a low variance estimator, but at the potential cost of bias. Now, is this a feature or a bug? Feature. Always a feature. Now Manish, you can answer. So, so yeah, and so this part, right. We don't want to account for noise, right? So Manish, this is where your point comes in, right? That uh, what backdrop is doing, backdrop doesn't necessarily find you the minimum classification error solution, but then if, but then uh, it prefers consistency over a potential cost of bias. And from our perspective, there's no reason for us to believe that this perspective is correct. But from our perspective, from our belief, this is a good thing. Because we believe we don't want to account for noise, as Muhammad says. So, and this is not just restricted to single neurons capturing linear decision boundaries. If I have a multi-layer perceptron, the multi-layer perceptron learns non-linear uh, decision boundaries, which are determined by the overall distribution of the training data. So simply adding one spoiler over here will not change the overall statistics greatly and the boundaries won't swing around. So even the network, when you train it using backdrop, it has low variance. And so coming to the end of that first topic, backpropagation will often not finding, find a separating solution, even though the solution is within the class of functions learnable by the network. This is the important thing. The solution is within the class of functions that that network can learn, but backdrop may not find it. And this is because the separating solution is not a feasible optimum for the last function. And one resulting benefit is that a backdrop trained neural network classifier has lower variance than an optimal classifier for the training data. Any questions? No, so there's a quiz, Anurag. Yes, pulling it up now. So 10 seconds, guys. 
All right, stop it. Maybe, but yeah, right. The, uh, you know, it's false, right? We just showed that it is false. So anyway, continuing. We found that minimizing the loss doesn't necessarily give you the minimum classification error solution. But if you, if you define your loss properly, this is going to de depend on how you define your divergence, how you define your loss, the consistency that Backprof will give you when it finds a minimum error solution is probably a good thing. But then here is this business. You know, if you define the final, if you define the loss properly, and if you find the minimum, uh, well, uh, this is that's tricky, right? We've assumed so far that when we spoke of gradient descent, that finding the parameters at the, at which the gradient descent converges is sufficient to find a good estimate for the network parameters. And clearly this is not right, right? Uh, because gradient descent simply stops making updates if the gradient goes to zero or if the loss stops decreasing. The loss is a function of network parameters. You can think of it as a surface on, in the space of network parameters. And the surface can be undulating, like this guy over here. Over here. It, can, it can be a pretty ugly surface where there are many points with zero gradient and most of these won't be the minimum. And gradient descent can end up at any of these places. And in fact, you know, the actual minimum solution may even be one as we saw earlier in the last class where the gradient is not zero. So simply finding a zero gradient might not even be the right thing. So uh, what exactly uh, does the loss surface look like? What are the kinds of situations that exist where you have gradients of zero at the wrong locations and where the algorithm can get stuck. So there are several hypotheses. One popular hypothesis is that in large networks, the majority of such points are saddle points. Locations like these, where the derivative is locally zero, but if you continue in any direction, in some directions, the function value is going to go back to increase in other directions, the function is going to begin decreasing. So uh, the fact that the loss increases in some directions but decreases in some others can be, uh, can be determined by inspecting the Hessian, the second derivative matrix at this point. Some of its eigenvalues corresponding to the directions in which the loss continues to go down, those eigenvalues will be negative, negative, right? and eigenvalues corresponding to directions in which the loss begins to increase, directions where it's a minimum, those eigenvalues will be positive. So the hypothesis, the saddle point hypothesis, hypothesis says that saddle points are extremely frequent in large networks and their frequency of occurrence is exponential in network size. The other type of situation where you can have zero gradient at spurious locations are local minima, like these guys. And like these little bowls here, which are local dips in the loss surface, but, but the actual minimum might lie elsewhere. Now, another hypothesis about local minima is that they are all equivalent, meaning that the loss value at the bottom of these local minima will more or less be very similar and close to the value that you'll find at the global minimum. This would mean that getting stuck in a local minimum is really not a problem since the loss will be as close to the optimal losses. Uh, you know, will be really very close to the optimal loss anyway. Now, regardless of all of these hypotheses, settling for a local minimum or a saddle point is not a great idea. And if possible, we should try to avoid getting stuck at such points. And again, these hypotheses are only meant for large networks with lots of parameters and lots of data and don't really hold for small ones. So we have to be careful. Now, just give me a second. I'm going to try to see if I can change my microphone now. Micro microphone's fine. I don't know why you're picking up the noises. So here's the story so far. Neural networks can be trained via gradient descent. 
that minimizes the loss function. Back propagation can be used to derive the derivatives of the loss. Back prop is not guaranteed to find a true solution, even if it exists and lies within the capacity of the network to model. The optimum for the loss function may not be the true solution. And for large networks, the loss function may have a large number of unpleasant saddle points at local minima, which backpropagation may find, and which we would like to avoid. Now, questions? Questions so far? Nothing? Okay. So, we sort of saw that find, we saw that finding the global minimum for backdrop isn't necessarily going to give you the best classification error. We've also found that, you know, uh, finding a play, you know, the location where gradient descent converges may not even be the global minimum. So it might be something you don't, you don't want to place some where you don't want to be. But there's a third, you know, there's a third problem. Even if it is headed towards the correct solution, how fast does it get there? Right. Does it always will will it get there? If I start off close to a you know global minimum, and if I run my, my my gradient descent, will it get there? And if it does get there, how long will it take? And if it doesn't, why didn't it get there? So uh, now this is very hard to analyze for a multi-layer perceptron, but we can look at it through the lens of. Uh, uh, convex optimization. Basically what we are going to do, what we, what we will do is to use the so-called street light effect. I don't know if you've heard of this. It's, it's, it's actually a real term. And uh, you might have all heard the joke about the guy who loses his keys in a dark bar and is later found looking for his keys under a traffic light or under a street light. And because, you know, this is the only place where he can see. It's too dark inside the bar to look anyways. So uh, we're going to use the same thing. We can't really analyze neural networks, which are very complex, but we do know how to analyze convex functions. And so that's what we're going to do and hope the intuitions will transfer. So first, what do we mean by, is my window open? No, give me a sec. So first, what do we mean by a convex function? function? A, a surface is convex if it is continuously curving upwards, like this one here. This is a convex surface, or this is a convex surface. Now, if a surface is convex, we can connect any two points on the surface or above the surface with a line and every point on the line is either going to be on the surface or above the surface. So you can see that this guy was convex. This guy, I sort of twisted it with the original curve that I had here, this was convex. On the other hand, this, surf, this curve over here, this is clearly not convex because this line intersects the curve. So this is, this is not a convex curve, it's called a convex curve or a convex surface. There are many mathematical definitions for convexity but they're all basically just equivalent to this concept. And we can similarly define convex sets. A convex set is a set such that if you pick any two points inside it and draw a line, every point on the line is going to stay within the set. So this set is convex, this set is convex, this set is not. Now, convex surfaces living on convex sets are nice and easy to study because they're bowl shaped and they have very nice uh, structured behavior and gradient descent. If, if you follow some simple rules, gradient descent will always converge to the bottom. So uh, we're going to look at convex functions, but then what do we mean by converging, right? Uh, gradient descent is an iterative algorithm to find the minimum of a function. And an iterative algorithm is said to converge to a solution if the solution estimate eventually arrives at a fixed point, like in this upper figure, the solution starts from here and, and sort of slowly arrives at this fixed point. 
Now, the algorithm may not actually converge. For example, it may come close to where you want it to go and then begin bouncing around, like in the second figure. Or it may even diverge. Instead of coming to the correct solution, it may get further and further away with the iterations. And for us, we obviously want this, this behavior. We want, this, we want the algorithm to converge. We want it to get to the correct solution. Now, we can quantify the convergence behavior of the algorithm through its convergence rate, which tells us how quickly the iterations approach the solution. There are several different definitions for converg convergence rate, but most of them are equivalent to this one over here, which uh, uh, tells us that where, where this convergence rate R uh, is defined as the ratio of how far the value of the function is from its minimum at the current estimate against how far it was at the previous estimate. So for example, if I have a function of this kind, this is the minimum and I have taken, this is my say XK and this is XK plus one. So this height, the ratio of this height to this height is called your, is the convergence rate. Now, if R is constant or upper bounded by a constant, say 0.5, this means that at each iteration, you at least halve the gap to the minimum. So we call this if for 0.5 or otherwise that the gap is going to decrease by a factor R. So uh, we call this again, for this to be convergent, you want R to be less than one. Meaning with each iteration, you want the you want the estimate to get closer to the minimum. So you want R to be less than one. And if R is upper bounded, then you have the kind of behavior where with the iterations, the distance to the minimum shrinks exponentially fast. In K steps, it's actually going to decrease by a factor R raised to K. Now this is called linear convergence. And the reason we call it linear convergence is that uh, if I've got some minimum and if I wanted to get within say some epsilon of the minimum, then you want R raised to K equals epsilon. So taking logs K equals log of epsilon divided by log of R. So it's a linear, the number of steps required to get to within any epsilon of the minimum is a function of log epsilon. So you call this linear convergence. It's just terminology. But this is the kind of behavior we really like that at each iteration, the gap to the minimum shrinks. And the ratio of uh, uh, how close you are to the minimum, how far you are to the minimum at the current step to how far you were at the previous step that is your convergence rate and you want it to be as close to zero as possible. Now, uh, it turns out that of all the various types of convex surfaces, yes, Gladys? Uh, excuse me, uh, could you go back to the previous slide? Yeah. Uh, what is in, on the right lower corner, you wrote R equals log epsilon. Is it over something? Oh, this was over log of R. So I got it from this one. Also oh, K is equal. Oh, okay, okay. I, I thought that one is an R. Okay. Sorry. Okay, all right. so this is a K, right? right? So basically K is a, is a linear function of log epsilon. I'm writing this, although the slide looks big on your screen, it's very small on mine. So my handwriting is squished. I should probably use my um, you know, whiteboard. Anyway, this is not so important. This is, right? It turns out that uh, of all the various types of convex surfaces, you can have quadratic surfaces, which have this kind of equation. They are uh, for positive A. They tend to have this nice bold shape with a, with a clear minimum, and they are the nicest. Now, you can, of course, solve for the minimum of a quadratic. You all learned how to do this in school. But let's assume you're doing it with gradient descent instead. So you initialize your parameter, you know, you, you're trying to find the W at which it is minimum. 
So if you were using gradient descent, we would initialize our estimate for the location of the minimum and then iteratively update our estimate according to this rule. This is the gradient descent rule. The current estimate minus the derivative times eta, where eta is your step size. Now focus on the step size. The step size is very important, okay? Now, uh, to see why we like quadratic surfaces, first let's try to uh, focus, let's try to compare a few different figures, right? So a quadratic surface is going to look something like this. Now a quadratic surface is, has this property that if you start off at some, some point, initially the derivative is going to be large, so you'll take a large step. Then the derivative begins to decrease and you sort of get more and more careful as you close to, come close to the minimum and then you arrive at the minimum. So, but instead of something that was x squared, suppose I had mod x, this is not a quadratic. That would be a function like this one, right? This too is convex. I mean, this was supposed to be a V. This too is convex. But the problem with this is that the derivative is always one or you know, magnitude is one. So the steps are going to be finite size, which means you're going to get to the close to the minimum pretty quickly. But then over here, unless you're lucky enough to land exactly here, you're going to keep bouncing around because this step is fixed size. And so you will never actually hit the minimum. So this one doesn't work. This guy, it has the property that the steps sort of converge as you can get to the, get to the minimum and it does the right thing. Now, suppose you had something like magnitude X cube. This too is convex, but this one will have slightly different behavior. This is going to be, let me see if I can get another pen. Magnitude X cube is going to look something like this. It's going to look flatter. If I do magnitude X4, it's going to be flatter still. So the problem here, what would the problem with things of this kind be? Anyone? What would the problem be? It would reduce quickly, but then at a point it would, uh, will not, will converge very, very slow. Yeah, it's just going to just... Yeah, the step would be at this point is going to slow down to yeah, nothing. Very, very slow. Right? So, yeah. it's, so it's very slow. So it turns out that the optimal kind of surface is a quadratic. And so we sort of use the quadratic as, uh, as uh, our gold standard to find out where the, uh, to analyze uh, gradient descent type solutions. Now look at this equation. We're, let's say I'm going to be minimizing the quadratic using this gradient descent rule, I start off at some initial estimate. What would the optimal step size be? What should the behavior of the optimal step size be? Anyone? Do you want to be the step size to be something that makes it take many steps to get here? Or do you want the step size to be something that gets here in one shot? One that gets there in one, one shot. One shot, right? That's because you want to get, it's, it's, it's clearly defined, boom. You, that's the step size you want. What is that step size? Can we derive it? Actually we can. Instead of putting it on you, let me do it, right? So here's what I can do. I can, so how many of you are familiar with Taylor series? All of you must be. Anyone who doesn't understand what a Taylor series is? Okay, I'm assuming all of you does, I do, right? So to answer what the optimal step size must be, I'm going to invoke Taylor series expansions. Consider any function f of x and assume that the fun it can have any form and assume that this function is differentiable. It has all of its derivatives. The Taylor series says that if you know all of the derivatives of this function at any x, you know, let me call this x, x zero, then you can, then be, and so basically that means you need, you know, f of x zero, you know, f prime of x zero, you know, you know, f double prime of x zero all the way to the end to infinity. Then you can write f of x equals f of x zero plus half of x minus x zero 
yeah, primal, wait, it's not half, yeah, so plus uh, uh, x minus x0 at prime of x0 plus half of x minus x0 squared f double prime of x0 and additional terms. So are you familiar with this, guys? Yes, no, raise your hands. Okay, this was easy, right? Now, when I'm trying to uh, compute a Taylor series for a quadratic function, how many terms will this have? If I'm doing a quadratic function, how many terms will this series expansion have? Three. Just three, right? It's going to have, because the additional derivatives are all zero. So I can say f of x zero minus x minus x zero f prime of x zero plus x minus x zero squared half f double prime of x zero. Now, if I have an initial estimate x zero, right? Is this approximation exact or is it an approximation? I mean, is this expansion exact or is it an approximation? Exact. It's exact because it's a quadratic, correct? Can I solve for the minimum for this one? I can, let me differentiate it. If I differentiate it with respect to X, that's simply going to give me F prime of X zero from this guy, right? Then plus two, two times one over two times X minus X zero F, I don't know what they did over here. I think this erases it. No. Give me a break, okay. So F X minus X zero, ignore the third thing. And F double prime of X zero. What is going on? F double prime of X zero, right? So this is our derivative. I equate it to zero. And if I solve for it, I'm, I'm going to get F prime of X zero. I can't see this. I have the solution on my screen. So let me, uh, Windows has a way of really making life horrible, right? But so here's what you're going to get. That solution is going to end up, you know, at the initial estimate, this, the exact solution you're going to get is going to say that the minimum happens at W0 minus the inverse of the second derivative of the quadratic at W0 times the first derivative of the quadratic at W0. This is a solution that you will get if you actually work it out. And it's trivial. It's just that my whiteboard is getting messed up. It's misbehaving, right? So let's assume that we can believe this. And I got this simply by finding the minimum for this Taylor series expansion. So assume that you believe this. Compare this to this, these two fun, these two equations. What is the optimal step size? Anyone? What is the optimal step size? One over the second derivative. This guy, right? If you just compare these two, this term is the same as this derivative. This term is the same as the one here. So this term that I'm circling has to be my step size, correct? Which means that the inverse of the second derivative is my optimal step size. And the inverse of the second derivative for this quadratic is simply a. The first derivative is going to be, uh, you know, uh, a w plus b. The second derivative, the w is gonna go away. You're gonna be left with a. So the second derivative of this is just a. And so the optimal step size is a inverse. And what this means is that if you have this optimal step size, which is the inverse of the coefficient for the quadratic term, then it doesn't matter where you begin, you're going to get to the solution in one step. So if you ever wondered how to solve for the minimum of a quadratic, you know, the stuff they told you in school, b squared minus four ac over two a, if it's a convex function, if a is positive, then you really didn't have to solve for it. You could have just solved this equation instead and that would have given you the answer.
Okay. Now, that is with the optimal step size. But then if your step size is not optimal, then bad things happen, right? Suppose this is my quadratic. If I use the optimal step size with optimal step size again, eta op equals, you know, E double prime of W inverse, which is E inverse, correct? So then from my current step, I'm going to get to the minimum in one step. What happens if my step size is, okay, that's in fact right here, right? The optimal step size is going to get to the up solution in one, one step. What would happen if my step size is less than the optimal step size? Anyone? It'll take more steps. It takes, more steps. It takes a, okay. it's, it's going to take steps. It's going to do this, right? But it's going to be, is it going to be monotonic? Yes. Yes, no? Yes. What would happen if my step size is greater than my optimal step size? Jump over the minimum. What would happen? It would jump over the minimum, but then at that point it's going to jump back. It's going to do this, right? Is there a step size which is too large? What happens if I'm exactly twice the optimal step size? Where will I go? Goes to the opposite. It's going to go straight here and then it's going to come back and it's going to keep bouncing back and forth, right? And if it's more than twice, it's going to sort of climb out. So, you know, you really want the step size to be between zero, zero, and two times eta op. And ideally you want it to be as close to eta op as possible to get their fastest, right? Now, uh, for that's for nice quadratic functions. For generic differentiable convex functions, any function, I can sort of approximate my generic function as a quadratic by taking a Taylor series of expansion and truncating it at after two, two uh, uh, terms. And so if this red curve is my function, then the quadratic approximation over here is gonna be this bowl. And if I uh, approximate it with my quadratic approximation, I know for that quadratic approximation, what is the step size that gets to the optimum in one step, right? For this guy, which may not necessarily be the optimum for this one, so you can you know, repeat the process that gives you uh, uh, Newton's method. But again, the point over here is that at any point, the optimal step size is still going to be the inverse of the, sec of the second derivative of the function at that point. And if the step size is greater than twice this, you know, twice this, then you can expect that the function will diverge. Everybody with me so far? Yeah, okay, so now that was for a single scale function of a scalar. Things get more complex when you get to multivariate functions. Consider a simple quadratic bowl, a paraboloid function of this kind, right? Except now W is a vector. So a quadratic function is going to have the form W transpose A W then so w would be a vector so if w is you know let me transpose so if i write if i write w transpose aw it's going to be w1 w2 dot dot then i'm going to have a matrix a and then w1 w2 and if a happens to be a diagonal matrix and the rest of them are zero then you can see immediately that this that this this just collapses to W1, W2 dot dot times A11, W1, A22, W2, etc., which simply becomes summation 
So I have the half here. So this becomes summation half AI, AI, I, I, I squared. And you get a corresponding term for the second term as well. And so when this A matrix is diagonal, this quadratic simply becomes the sum, independent sum of several independent quadratics in each of the variables W. When A is not diagonal, it's going to be a little more complex, but it turns out the complexity is really not anything to be worried about. If you simply figure out how something of this kind behaves, you that translates immediately to the case where A is not a diagonal matrix and how that translates is on the slides. I won't go over it now. Let's just focus on this kind of multivariate quadratic, okay? So now, when you have a multivariate quadratic, which where I'm assuming a diagonal A, it has a form of this kind. Now, as a, consider a two-dimensional quadratic. So along W1, it's going to be a bowl. Along W2, it's going to be a bowl. What will change is that because it's a, so, you know, so if you look at both of them jointly, the entire thing, the entire function is going to be a bowl, if I can draw it, of this kind. And if you look at the bowl from top, it's going to look like this. All of these lines over here, these ellipses I'm drawing, they are equal value contours. So on any single ellipse, the value of the function is the same. And now, if you uh, take a slice of this function, so let's say I took a slice out here, that, that value is going to look like something like this. If I took a slice over here, that value is going to look something like this. If I took a slice over here, that value is going to look something like this. And so what you find is all of these quadratics are basically the same, all of these slices are the same quadratic at different heights. And why the different heights? Because this I'm plotting, if this is W2 and this is W1, I'm plotting this under W2 and W2, and this quadratic itself is a quadratic of W1 plus a quadratic of W2. And if I take this at different values of W1, this guy changes, which changes the height of the board. But the important thing is regardless of where you slice it, the minimum is at the same point in W2. The same thing happens if I slice it the other way. If I slice it in the horizontal direction, all of the slices are going to be quadratics. It is going to be at different heights. And that's again, because this is a quadratic of W1 plus quadratic of W2. That's what we had earlier, right? Yeah, that's what we had. That's what we have here. And so if I slice it at different W2s, this guy changes, but as a, come on, this guy changes, but, and this function, so, so the height of the quadratic changes as a function of W1 but the minimum is always going to be at the same point. So uh, did you guys understand this figure, what I was doing with this quadratics? It might have been confusing. Uh, if it's not, Igli, you're not the standard, <laughs> but anybody else? Um, can you explain so guys, that again? Okay, thank you, right? That's what I want. So this is, let me do this on a canvas. So I can think of a quadratic of W1, W2, right? Sorry, W2 as a quadratic over W1 plus a quadratic over W2. Now this is not the generic case. The most generic case is going to be W1, W2 times some A11, A12, A21, A22, W1, W2. This is a, quad this is a quadratic in a two on a two dimensional vector, okay? But if this matrix is, has zero, is a diagonal matrix, this simply becomes A11, W1 squared plus A22, W2 squared. I mean, I'm, I'm ignoring the, uh, the uh, additional terms right i'm just so i'm ignoring the 
uh, plus b1 w1 plus b2 w2 so let's just ignore this this is a quadratic on w1 this is a quadratic on w2 so this clear yeah okay so now suppose i plot q of w against w1 and w2 right now if i look at this is going to look like a ball right at any given w1 as a function of w2 it's going to be this ball right i mean it's curving up like so like that right at any given w1 it's going the as a function of w2 it's going to be a ball but the height so this this is curving in the third in the third dimension and um, sort of being crappy in this so this is this is height okay and this height is simply going to be the value of w1 at which you are computing it do that make sense yeah it makes sense right so that's all we're saying and so yeah yeah so in this way we are getting the minimum of w1 right if we are plotting horizontal no, we're getting, lines so if we are getting the, the of minimum of the value with res with res with respect to w1 right yeah and so the w1 at which the, and and over here if i was looking at it i'd be finding the minimum with respect to w2 but then so so if i were trying to find the value of w where the function is a minimum right because these balls are all have the same minimum regardless of w1 in this case and regardless of w2 in this in this case i can find the minimum for w1 independently of the minimum for w2 correct yes no yes exactly so yes, right and so this is the quadratic for w1 this is a term that doesn't involve w1 this is the quadratic for w2 and i could do gradient descent independently for these two guys but here's the problem when i'm performing gradient descent this is my gradient descent rule right if this is my gradient descent rule i have a step size and the step size that i'm using is going to be the same for every dimension right and because the step size is the same for every dimension i'm going to have a problem right and let me skip the slide because i'm running behind consider this quadratic now along the vertical axis i have a nice shallow quadratic on the horizontal axis i have a very steep quadratic as you can see by these balls right now imagine that this shallow the, the quadratic in the vertical dimension has an optimal step size of 1 and the quadratic in the horizontal dimension has an optimal step size of 0.33 okay now because of the manner in which we perform gradient descent where the step size is the same for every dimension over here that means we are going to use the same step size in both the horizontal and the vertical directions so let's say i was using a step size of 0.33 say 7 what would happen would it converge in the vertical direction where the optimal step size is 1 so would it converge in the vertical direction yes now right in the vertical direction is going to converge slowly you know quite linearly right Uh, monotonically in the horizontal direction it's more than 0.66 it's going to blow up now on the other hand if i used a step size of exactly 0.66 what happens once again in the vertical direction it's going to converge but in the horizontal direction it's going to keep bouncing around if i were using a step size of you know 0.33 times 1.5 which is between 1 and 2 times the optimal step size for the horizontal direction i will continue to converge in the vertical direction but then in the horizontal direction it's going to bounce around 
But then what about the rate of convergence in the vertical direction? Which of these three is it the fastest? Guys, and which of these three cases is it fastest in the vertical direction? 0 0.7. 0 0.7, right? And so if I actually try to make it so it doesn't bounce around and you know get, get I, give, I give you the optimal step size in the horizontal direction, in the vertical direction, it's going to become very slow. If I try to become sort of conservative, even in the horizontal direction, in the vertical direction, it's going to take forever to converge. And so you have the situation where, uh, and again, then, so I'll skip the slide. I'm just making the same statement for uh, non-quadratic convex functions. You can always treat non-quadratic convex functions as quadratics by taking the second order Taylor series approximation and analyzing it. So what happens over here is that the convergence behaviors became, become increasingly unpredictable as dimensions increase. For the fastest convergence, ideally the learning rate must be close to both the optimal learning rate for the shallowest surface and the optimal learning for, for this and uh, for the uh, and the optimal learning rate for the steepest steepest slice so it must be close close to both the largest optimal uh, uh, you know, uh, optimal learning rate and the smallest optimal learning rate in order to ensure convergence in every direction and this is generally infeasible so in particular, if the uh, ratio of the largest optimal learning rate to the smallest optimal learning rate is large, this is a condition number, you're always going to try to make it sort of converge for the worst case, the worst case dimension, and the overall convergence is going to be very, very slow. Uh, we have uh, more slides discussing this problem, they're hidden. Please take a look. Okay, so this is this how we deal with this kind of situation is a big topic for optimization. So, uh, is it in the numerator? Yeah. Uh, should that be a maximum? Yeah, this should be a. There's an x missing. Okay, thanks. Right. So, but then all of the analysis we saw was learned on trying to based on trying to ensure that the step size was not so large as to cause divergence within a convex region, right? You wanted this to hold in every direction, but how critical is this? Is this really uh, that important? Now, consider we have an ugly function like this guy. And let's say your initial estimate was over here. Then do you really want your step size, and this is, and let's even assume that this portion of the function is nice and quadratic, right? That each of these goals is quadratic. Do you really want your step size to be so small that it converges nicely and cleanly over here? Yes or no? No. No, so what would you want it to do? Want it to jump out of the hole. Diverge. And, uh, you want no it to diverge at this point, right? So, always but then so you want it to be greater than the twice the optimal step size but do you all do you want it to always be greater than twice the optimal step size no it's going to keep going and you know it's going to it, it will never settle down right it's going to bounce around so what do we want to do add a momentum no. Have a variable rate. You want to have a decaying learning rate. You want to start with a large learning rate, which is greater than, you know, two, I'm assuming uh, two times the second derivative, right? But this is, uh, and then uh, inverse of the second derivative, and then slowly reduce it with iteration. So, uh, what this will do is that it will initially cause the algorithm to sort of diverge out of local minima and then eventually it will get small enough that it gets trapped in a bowl but if you're doing this carefully the kind of bowl that it's going to get trapped in is going to be one of these big bowls big and big bowls tend to be deep and big bowls typically tend to be pretty decent local minima if not the global minimum and so 
the way for this to work is to have a learning rate theta which starts off large and then shrinks with the iterations to find, if not this solution, at least this guy. And so learning the, uh, reducing the learning rate with iterations is what is called learning rate decay. Now a number of different methods have been proposed for this in the literature. For example, you know, uh, the DK after the kth iteration is eta zero or the initial learning, you start with an initial learning rate and then the kth, learn, kth iteration, the learning rate is eta zero over k plus one. You have the quadratic decay, which is eta zero or k plus one squared. Uh, you can have the learning rate fall off exponentially or one common approach is to start with a fixed learning rate until the, until the loss on some held out set stagnates and then decrease it by some factor and keep doing this. Now, it turns out there are some very strong principles on how the learning rate must decay. And these guys actually satisfy those principles, but without knowing these principles, if you try something ad hoc, things won't work. We will get to this in the next class. So questions, anybody? Um, um, I, I yeah. would like to know, um, is it, is it, oh, can we say that we can get the, like, lower minimal every time? I mean, probably sometimes we can get to, get to the higher minimal. So, uh, uh, statistically speaking, right, you can, you can make no assurances, but what this kind of, what this kind of uh, schedule sort of gives you is that with high probability, after some time you'll end up in a big bowl that you won't escape out of because the learning rate keeps decreasing. And big bowls, statistically speaking, tend to be, global minima tend to be in these big areas, big valley areas. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, can you, uh, can you explain what uh, Haitian normalization is? So I haven't, it's there on the slides. Can you take a look? I'm going too slow. We have what, 13 minutes. I'm gonna to have to skip some topics. But if you take it on the Piazza, I will answer, right? So here's the thing. Gradient descent can miss obvious answers. This may be a good thing. Convergence issues abound. The loss surface has many saddle points, right? And vanilla gradient descent may not converge or may converge too, too slowly. And so also divergence causing learning rates, however, and not, may not be a bad thing, particularly for ugly loss functions. And decaying learning rates provide a good compromise between escaping poor local minima and convergence. Now, many of these convergence issues arise because we have forced the same learning rate on all, uh, on, on all parameters. And uh, we would like to sort of not force them. Now there's a quiz over here, Anurag, can you release it? Ten seconds, guys. So only the first one is true, right? Because for quadratic functions, gradient descent will converge even without decaying learning rates. And uh, large step sizes are a good thing in the initial phases of gradient descent so that you can escape local minima. Uh, the, uh, so this is always a bad thing is not true. 
only the first one is right. All right. So what was the reason we have all of these problems? These problems arise because we are requiring a fixed step size across all dimensions. Basically, when I use something like this, then the step size in every dimension is the same. We are tying the step size to the grid and uh, across to the gradient. So it stays the same across all dimensions. We might want to release this requirement and say, okay, the step sizes can be different for the different dimensions. And, uh, and uh, then, you know, things will sort of converge better. And so based on this principle, there have been a great many solutions proposed and two really good solutions are R prop and quick prop. I was going to do R prop today, but you know, as part of this lecture, it's not critical, so I'm not going to cover it. But R prop is in the quiz, so please look up both R prop and quiz quick prop on the slides. I'm actually going to. It's R prop stands for resilient propagation. It's a very very trivial algorithm, and uh, in fact, let me quickly summarize it. Uh, here you sort of treat each parameter independently. You only use the sign of the derivative. You do not use the magnitude of the derivative and the uh, updates are done indiv individually for each derivative. So this is not gradient descent anymore. This is an alternative to gradient descent. And what you would do is you start off at some initial value and depending on, you check the gradient uh, initial value for W, you check the gradient. If the gradient is negative, you take an initial step forward. If it's positive, you take an initial step backward. This thing is decided. Then you take a step. And then after taking a step, you uh, check the gradient again. If the gradient was negative here and the negative gradient is still negative over here, you increase your step by some factor alpha to get to some new point. And then at the new point, you check your gradient again, your derivative. And if the sign of the derivative is still negative, it means you're going in the right direction. You'll increase the step size again with some factor alpha. And if you keep doing this at some point, eventually you're going to overshoot the minimum. And then what will happen is that when you check your derivative, you will find that the sign of the derivative is opposite of the sign of the derivative from the previous step. At that point, you will go back to where you were in the last step and then reduce your step size by a factor beta and take a smaller step forward. And so it's a very simple, very trivial algorithm that is independently followed for every single component it's not gradient descent. The only thing you're following is the sign of the derivative and the rest of it is heuristic. And what is amazing is that it really, really works. It works at least as well as standard gradient descent and it works better than most of the optimization techniques out there today on many problems. And I'm kind of surprised that it's not more popular. So uh, here is the uh, pseudocode for R prop. Please look it over on the slides. Right. Uh, it's a remarkably simple first-order algorithm that is uh, fr frequently much more efficient than gradient descent and can be competitive against, against even some of the more advanced second-order methods and only makes minimal assumptions about the loss function. So I was supposed to have a quiz here, but I'll skip that. There's a similar algorithm called quick prop, uh, which again, I won't get into the details. It's on the slides. Quick prop employs Newton updates with empirically derived derivatives. The big problem in all of these is computing second order derivatives. And so uh, quick prop uh, approximates these using differences. And again, this is another algorithm that works really, really well. This was invented by our own uh, Scott Fowlman. But anyway, uh, simply because I'm running out of time, let's move on. I may go five minutes over, folks, just please bear with me. Now, the issue with convergence of gradient descent is that if we have the same learning rate for all components, learning rates that cause some components to converge will cause other components to diverge. 
So let's come up with a compromise. How about this? We don't keep track of how things behave. You know, uh, I mean, why don't we keep track of how things behave in the different directions and adjust our step sizes in the different directions accordingly? So let's follow some initial uh, update rule. And then we find, for example, that it's converging linearly or it's converging monotonically in uh, this, say, this vertical direction, but in the horizontal direction, it's bouncing around. So when that happens, we will increase the step size, but we will decrease the step size because we know that the step size is too much over here, but it's okay over here. So you want to emphasize steps and directions that converge smoothly and shrink the steps in the directions that bounce around. This leads us to momentum methods. The idea is to maintain a running average of all of the past steps. Now imagine that I have, these are my derivatives, right? These are my gradients. If these are my gradients, observe that in every one of these guys, I have the horizontal component is like so, the vertical component is like so for this first guy. For the second guy, the horizontal component is like so, the vertical is like so. For the third guy, the horizontal component is like so, the vertical is like so. For the fourth one, it's this way and this way. What would happen if I averaged these four guys? What would the horizontal component be? Is it still going to be large? Vertical will decrease, I guess. The vertical, the positives and the negatives are going to cancel each other out, right? But the horizontal is going to remain. So maintaining a running average of the gradients will naturally sort of, and using that for your update, instead of directly using the update, is naturally going to sort of cancel out the directions where the gradient keeps bouncing around, the derivative keeps bouncing around. And so, this is what we will do in our uh, momentum update. Uh, there are a couple of different variants to this basic idea. The first one is your standard momentum. And the standard momentum, what we will do is we will literally, we will literally try to average all the gradients that we have got until now at each iteration, except instead of just maintaining the gradients, we are going to do a running average. So at each point, let's say you took this step. This was your update in the k step. And then from here, you compute the gradient and then eta times negative of eta times gradient takes you, let's say, this way over here. Instead of simply taking this step to this guy, you will add a reduced version of this one, which will take you here. And that is going to be your final step. So this was your kth update. After the kth update, you found the gradient to be this guy, but instead of simply directly using, you know, the gradient is this way. So this is your gradient step. Instead of simply directly using this, you're going to average this main computer running average of this step and this step, right? And this, so this step times some beta is going to be this one. This is your gradient step. The sum of the two is this guy. And so this is the step that you would take. Then in the next iteration, at this location, you would compute the gradient again. And maybe the gradient step is like so, right? But instead of simply going here, you're going to take a running average of this guy and this one, which is to say you're going to take this step, add to it some beta times this guy, and that is going to be your step. So this is your momentum technique where you're maintaining a running average of the steps, which is basically a running average of all of the gradients. And hopefully this cancels out the directions in which things are oscillating and emphasizes directions where things are going in a monotonic manner. So that's what this gradient update rule says. At each time the step is going to be the gradient step at the current location plus some beta times the previous step. And that is what you're going to use to update your parameter. 
So did this make sense to everyone? Uh, so are you, so do you mean uh, after you average uh, the current uh, direction and the past directions, are you adding that average uh, directly or are you directly? You're not averaging, you're not averaging the direction, you're averaging the steps. So, you know, let's say this was the way you ended up after the, after the, after K iteration, K minus one iterations, right? So then you computed your step and your, this is the kth step, okay? So this is, let me call this delta W K minus one, right? Then from here, you compute your gradient. Then maybe the gradient is in this direction. So your gradient step is this. This is going to be eta times the gradient, right? That's this one. So then you go back, you pull out this one, you multiply it by some beta, you append it over here and add the two. Does that answer your question at all? Uh, what factor are you multiplying uh, by the previous step? So, so, the, so the beta and this eta is your learning rate. Beta is typically like 0.9, it's written right here, right? Oh, I see. So the larger beta is, the, lead, the larger beta is the more you smooth it. And what this will do is it will sort of shrink your steps in oscillating directions, you'll learn, and it's going to increase the steps in, or at least maintain the steps in consistent directions. And so you're going to get a much smoother convergence to the optimum uh, instead of bouncing around. So this pseudocode for it, I'll skip that. Uh, but then, there's an update you can do even to this. Give me a couple more minutes, guys, okay? In the basic momentum method, what we did was we came here, then we computed the gradient and took, and took a gradient step. And then to this, we added a scaled version of this guy and that gave us our final step, right? So the operation here was at this location, First, you computed the gradient, and then you added a scaled version of the original step. It turns out if you change the order, it ends up being far more optimal. So in the standard momentum step, from this location, this was the first step. Then you added the scaled version of this guy. This was the second addition, and this was your final update. Instead of that, here's what we can do. I will first add the scaled version of the previous step to this one and then compute the gradient. And that will be my final step. So you see the difference? Earlier, you went this way and then added something. Added something here. You first added it and then computed the gradient step. It turns out this guy is far more optimal than you use than the momentum method. And this is Nesterov's accelerated gradient method. In many settings, it is the best thing you can do. It's optimal. So uh, uh, here's the equation for it. The current step, which is this guy, is going to be this one, beta times the previous step, minus this one, plus this one, which is you know, minus eta times the gradient computed at this location. So this parenthesis is basically the, the gradient of the loss at this location. So you would compute the step in this manner and then update your network parameters with this step. Then again, at the next iteration, you're here. So you would extend this by say to this point, compute the gradient, and that is going to be your step. That's Nesterov's accelerated gradient. So, uh, and, and Hinton has a very nice uh, uh, visualization of how this thing works, a, uh, which compares regular momentum to Nesterov's. So in this problem, here's the earlier step. Regular momentum would first compute the gradient and then add a scaled version of this guy and end up at this point. Whereas Nesterov's, would first go here, add this guy, and then compute the gradient and end up at this point. 
and you can very clearly see that you know if I repeat this this guy next step it will go here then here and that's going to be the next step whereas nest cross method is simply going to end up at the optimum you know you extend this and find and take the gradient step you end up at the optimum uh, immediately so uh, you can see that uh, Nesterov's method, that Nesterov's accelerated gradient is actually going to be faster, faster than uh, regular momentum, which in turn is going to be faster than simple gradient descent. So again, I have pseudocode for it. I'll stop here. I've sort of hurried through uh, some of the class simply because I spent too much time on explaining the quadratics and convergence issues. So I sort of uh, recommend that all of you guys uh, go through the slides because there's a lot on the slides that I couldn't cover in class and uh, post any and all questions that you might have on Piazza. Okay, so I'll stop here. If there are any questions, we will take them. I'm happy to take them. Anurag, you can stop the recording. Uh, on page 